Good afternoon and welcome to our work session. We're going to start off by conducting a roll call. Uh, Commissioner Felicia Franklin. Present. Commissioner Gail Hambrick. Present. Commissioner Sonna Gregory. Commissioner DeMont Davis. Okay, Madam Clerk, just for the record, show Commissioner Davis and Commissioner Gregory currently not with us. All right, are there any preliminary items that any other present board members would like to discuss in reference to next week's meeting? All right, here in uh, our first work session discussion item will be Parks and Recreation Update. Mr. Troy Hodges. All right. Good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, we'll begin with uh, trying to you know, want to give you probably take 30, 45 minutes. Is that okay, Chairman? <laughs> And it'll probably take five or ten minutes and basically I'll just uh, tell you guys uh, you know our story um, so next slide uh, I'll send you the the current presentation I know it may be hard for you to see at home um, but I'll send you that organizational chart uh, basically that just depicts our seven divisions and those full-time employees under um, Parks Recreation. Next slide. Uh, the Parks Recreation Department is um, celebrating 50 years. We were established in 19, um, November of 1971. Um, celebrating 50 years. Over those 50 years, we have acquired 16 parks, 29 tennis courts. Uh, we have just installed 10 pickleball courts with five recreation centers, 14 trails, trail miles. Uh, those trails consist of River's Edge uh, Greenway, the Jester's Creek Trail that goes from uh, Mount Zion Road to the Headquarters Library and over um, at International Park, the four phases that goes from the golf course over to Waverly Way. Uh, we have seven divisions and I'll briefly describe each of those divisions shortly. 48 athletic fields, 17 pro, uh, playgrounds, two bark parks, four swimming pools, one natatorium, which is the Steve Lundquist Aquatic Center, a uh, Reynolds Nature Preserve, the Spivey Splash Water Park, which is in progress, and we'll go over that as well, the Sky Trail Roach Course, which is in pro progress, and I will explain the uh, national accreditation that our department holds. Next slide. The, 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 the accreditation, of course, is the uh, national accreditation and it is the Commission for Accreditation of Parks and Recreation Agencies. Um, being accredited is a way for the Clayton County citizens basically to, uh, that the Clayton County citizens can hold our department accountable uh, with doing the best practices in the parks recreation industry. And um, there are 154 standards that we meet, uh, have to meet in order to, put, you have to meet in order to become accredited. Um, we, we, we become, we initially received our accreditation when uh, Dietrich uh, Stanford was director back in the 70s. <laughs> uh, I, think it was, I think it was like 10 years ago. And uh, this is our second reaccreditation uh, that we're going through uh, now. So we'll, we'll go through that accreditation, reaccreditation process in June. Uh, we are there's only 10 agencies in the state of Georgia that are nationally accredited. Uh, we were the, four, the first, under, uh, first county agency to become accredited in the state of Georgia. Uh, there are now four counties in the state of Georgia that are accredited, and we are one of 183 agencies nationwide that are accredited. 
Um, the athletic division is our first division that I'll go over. Uh, post pandemic, we post COVID-19, uh, we have had to kind of revamp our, what we offer the kids and get, um, detailing the, you know, with the COVID and uh, those restrictions that are in place, we developed the rotating recess program that basically it rotated from park to park with limited numbers. Um, we, we revamped our youth basketball program to a three on three type program as opposed to, you know, nine to 10 players per team. Uh, along the walk and read program, you, you may have seen that in our parks. It's, uh, we developed that in conjunction with the uh, Clayton County Library System to where the kids or adults can go, go walk through a, a park and scan a QR code and, and read a book along, you know, the further they walk in the, in, on the trail, the, the more pages they get to read. Um, that's a very popular program. Uh, that we just started up. We developed a youth cycling program along with the Skills Academy. And right now, currently, we are in our spring uh, programming, which is the track, soccer, baseball, and softball, and tennis. Uh, we are currently registering for our fall programming, which consists of football, soccer, and cheerleading. We continue to do our uh, facility rentals with the uh, outside organizations renting the parks for their tournaments. Um, and that's our athletics program. Our green space program it consists of the Reynolds Nature Preserve in Morrow. It has 146 acres of natural uh, woodland and wetland habitat. The, it has a, uh, in conjunction with the Clayton State University, the, bio, the biology and ecology student outdoor labs. Uh, we have a trail and preserve management program that we adhere to, outdoor classrooms, Georgia, uh, the Georgia Audubon Society birch wa bird watching hike is a, a station out there uh, developed with the Georgia Audubon Society. We have audio tours that you can, uh, again, scan these QR codes and it tells, tells you about, say for instance, the historical uh, barn that is out there. It'll tell you a little bit of history about that. The pollinator garden, which is a pollinator garden. Uh, it is on Rosalind Carter's butterfly garden registry. Um, and that's a very popular uh, program that Stephanie puts on out there. The annual Yule log is, is a yearly program we do along with the spring fest, which is also known as uh, the Azale Azalea Festival. River's Edge Greenway, um, it's our largest natural green space. It consists of 197 acres. It is the, uh, the previous River's Edge golf course uh, down in the River's Edge subdivision. Currently we have about a, a three quarters of a mile trail that um, is, is partially on, on the golf course and we're looking to expand uh, that trail system very soon. We're going to be doing a, um, a survey along with uh, Chief Merkson and uh, the communications. We'll survey the, the area to see how they want it to look. Uh, the International Park Trail System is already established. You know, it's, uh, we have approximately six and a half miles of, of trail out there. The Jester's Creek Greenway, of course, goes from the Mount Zion South Lake Mall area back to the headquarters library. Um, that's the green space. And next slide. All right, International Park. Uh, currently, you know, there are, there's a lot of construction that is going on out there. Um, you know, we have three pavilions that we are currently renting. Uh, due to construction and we continue to have our fishing derby series, our bark park uh, out there is very very popular, our walking and hiking trails, we have picnic areas, the water water park renovation, Spivey Splash which we'll get to here shortly, uh, the Sky Trail, the VIP Amphitheater is um, 
being being renovated and that is in the process of the design now. Uh, the tennis center, of course, we hold the Alta and the USA team uh, tournaments. We are also <coughs> going to be the host of a uh, the national 2021 national wheelchair tennis uh, tournament that will be uh, done in conjunction with Henry County. Uh, so that's going to be a huge tournament for the wheelchair tennis program. Um, so this is a minute a minute long video and it just basically I just wanted to give you a uh, preview of what is to come out <coughs> of International Park. There's no, no sound. So <coughs> Okay, so see right there in the middle, that's gonna be the kiddie pool. The water park consists of a, a kind of a toddler infant area, which is there to your right. The middle area is for a little bit taller, more grown up kids. And the there's a area back there in the back that'll host um, uh, water, ball, water, water basketball. It'll have three basketball goals in the middle of it. Uh, of course, you can see the slide where it dumps the kids out into the pool. They can go right over into the basketball. Uh, very popular flow rider that you see on the <coughs> cruise ships. Uh, that's uh, gonna be a, a, an attraction as well. Uh, and of course, Georgia's longest lazy river. Um, it's over 1,500 feet long. And there in the background, as you see, is the red and blue structure that is the ropes course that uh, <coughs> you will be able to strap yourself into a um, a sling and you know jump off of a two-story structure and um, you know have fun with that and in the background you can see we've got new parking lots that are going in the the VIP complex is under uh, almost I would say 80% done with the inside renovations and the of course the stadium is stadium renovation is just now getting underway uh, with the <coughs> with the design. Okay, our marketing and communications department. Uh, basically, what they do is they have developed video production. The the videos are becoming more and more popular and in the, the demand. Um, they have a we have a meet the people campaign and uh, they handle all of the Clayton County Parks and Recreation website uh, as well as the social media with uh, Facebook Twitter um, snapchat all of the all of the major social medias you know they update those and all of our department publications our parks park services uh, department, of course, you know, we, you know, they take care of the 37 different parks. Um, they also are responsible for the disinfection of all of our playground equipment. Um, they, they spray that once a week. All of our facilities, along with the, under the training of Chief Murkison, um, we, we put them in responsible for spraying down and disinfecting all of our facilities as well. Um, the ball field rest restoration from mulch application to amenities and grounds enhancements to equipment management. The payroll and procurement, payroll and procurement department, uh, they handle our uh, CAPRA reaccreditation process that we're going through, handle all of the procurement, payroll functions, employee files, management, new hire, we are one of the uh, few departments in the county that handle all of our new hire processing and orientation processes. We do the workman's comp, the FMLA, employee training, uh, department policies and procedure manuals, and any ro open records requests are handled in our payroll and procurement division. Our recreation services, of course, consist of all of the, uh, the five recreation centers, uh, 
uh, and that ranges from, you know, the virtual gaming is also a big, uh, e-gaming is becoming a, a, new, a new topic. So, you know, when I put forth that we need several new PlayStations and Xboxes and controllers and, and that, that's not for the office, that's for e-games. E-games is becoming very, very popular. Um, we handle our movie under the under, under the stars series. Um, our summer camp, you know, our summer camp is is full this year. We have reduced our numbers from 100 per site to 50 per site due to the COVID, um, and we are able to, um, as long as we have the staff the, to to work the summer camps, we will be able to increase those as the the guidelines. Uh, lacks if they do um, we, that's all recreation services also handles our community garden management and the recycling program um, the extravagant you know all of our special events is, are handled under our recreation services division so th those were our seven our seven different divisions under the parks recreation I have also highlighted here some of the 2020 SPLOST projects that will be upcoming within the next, or as the funds become available and allocated. Um, from Rex Park to Mar Lake City, Rum Creek, Steve Lundquist Aquatic Center uh, roofing, um, the Virginia Stevens House is uh, needing to be restored, all the way down to park improvements and VIP amphitheater renovations. And that's, that is our story that will be uh, continued as time goes on. And I'll be glad to take any questions that you guys may have at this time. All right. Well, we appreciate the presentation. Only question I have is uh, reference to the hiring for the summer. Have we already started? Yes, sir. And yeah. are, do, are we finding that uh, young people are applying or... It's, very, it still sparse? it's been slow compared to years past. Um, we will be okay for our summer camp, you know, uh, but I would say it's, it's been slow. Kids are still, the, the summer staff are still going through the process, um, you know, as we today, you know, we, we processed four of them today. Uh, it's just been a slow process. What's the start date for the summer camps? Uh, June, June 2nd. Next week. Okay. Any other board member have any questions? Hearing none. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Hodges, for your presentation. Let's go straight to the fire department promotional procedures, Chief Merks. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I'm pleased to come to you this evening, um, I guess, with two presentations. The first being proposed modifications to Appendix B of the Clayton County Civil Service Rules, um, which is entitled Fire Department Promotional Procedures. Ooh, that is sensitive. Um, a little bit about the timeline of this project. This project actually started back um, early to mid-2019. I sat down and had a meeting with Chairman and COO just to give them an update on where we were with our promotional procedures and how we wanted to proceed with restoring competitive testing, which had been the standard um, prior to them being changed um, some years ago. And the purpose of this was to bring us um, and CCPD back in line and restore parity and kind of how our promotional processes were handled and, and how we, we completed those processes. And that was followed by several meetings between my organization, CCPD, um, legal, and human resources in which we sat down and worked through the process. Um, as we had kind of narrowed the, or got to the end of that, um, we had selected a test provider and began the process of validating those tests um, within our organization to ensure um, that they met our needs and met the actual job requirements that we have. And then of course, as luck would have it, COVID hit um, and pretty much shut down everything that we had kind of started working on. Um, so now we are ready to, uh, to bring those, those long-awaited changes um, to the board um, to make sure that we are in line with, with CCPD. And one of the tests that we will talk about 
is the next generation firefighter test, which we are currently using um, as it, it's not covered under Appendix B in these procedures. A little bit about the company um, that we use, um, it's Industrial and Organizational Solutions, and they're a company that provides nationwide services for fire law enforcement corrections and dispatch agencies. They not only do promotional testing, they do um, early entry testing, they do um, ongoing job um, proficiency testing, and one of the things that drove us um, to them is when we went to select a provider, we wanted to make sure that as we look at the fact that we are now an accredited agency um, internationally, we have standards that we have to meet. And one of the burgeoning topics in the fire service and um, is kind of a focal point of a document that we use to draft these procedures um, is a document put out by our accrediting body called 21st Century Fire and Emergency Services. And within that document, a lot of the things that we do now are driven toward inclusiveness, diversity, um, and making sure in all of our programs and policies. And that's one of the things that drove us to industrial organizational solutions is they were one of the only companies we looked at that actually have um, their three tenets as dimension, diversity, and defensibility. So when we look at the test and, and we start looking at kind of how we will go about this process, I know, Chairman, you'll remember there's rarely a promotional process that doesn't get challenged. Um, in some way, shape, form, or fashion as chief of police. I know you dealt with it. Uh, many of the promotions I took always got challenged. So one of the things we wanted to make sure of is that we're using a process that's been well, vet well vetted, has been challenged, and has stood up um, in all tenants. And as you can see under defensibility, um, this company's products have been tested and withstood um, scrutiny all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court um, as, a, as these processes have been challenged. Everything they do is heavy in diversity. As it says, the best public safety department will reflect the diversity of its community. A large part of that diversity is reflective of the individual's cultural, racial, and gender identities. So IOS believes in developing tools that promote racial, promote cultural, racial, and gender diversity is one of the most important facets of our job. That's why we've changed pretty much our hiring processes and almost hire now exclusively out of the public school system. Um, what better way to have an organization that represents your community than to hire specifically out of your community and bring those young men and women into our organization. Um, and that leads us to the next generation firefighter exam. This is the um, firefighter exam that we use as we're screening applicants. Um, as you can see, the NGFF was originally developed um, by CWA's research as their premier entry level firefighter examination offering. Um, this exam combines a straightforward cognitive ability measure with multiple situational judgment measures as well as mechanical aptitude measure. Um, this exam focuses on utilizing tools and measures that have minimal impact on protected classes. And as you can see down at the bottom, it gives you a little bit of inf insight into their measurement domains in both cognitive, situational judgment, and mechanical aptitude. Um, once again, Mr. Chairman, this, this test replaces the legacy civil service exam that we used to give with the gears and the, the knobs and the levers and, and the road maps. Um, and the more recently used Wonderlick exam and ergometric exam, which are not geared toward firefighters or public safety. Um, additionally, they did not take into consideration inclusiveness um, or diversity. And we have had, so far using this as our entrance exam, have had tremendous um, luck in reaching um, those um, employees that previously um, were not successful in the exams that we used. Um, moving forward into um, what Appendix B does cover, the Firefighter Driver Engineer Examination, also known in our world as Sergeants. Um, this exam is designed to measure the candidate's knowledge of equipment use, pump and ladder operations, and general fire ground tactics. This exam is distinct from traditional job knowledge tests in that it is based primarily on situational scenarios rather than just testing memorization skills. Um, the product results will save time and resources by finding candidates that are knowledgeable and are prepared for promotional opportunities. And one of the things that we also liked about this particular product is they do offer an online um, portion which allows us to speed the process up with human resources and allows HR to interact um, directly with um, the exam provider for those results. It is a 60 question exam. Candidates given two hours and 30 minutes um, to take the exam and results are typically received in 24 to 48 hours of receiving um, the answer sheets. Um, the final test that's covered under the renovation or the modifications to Appendix B is the Lieutenant's Exam, also known as Company Officer 1. And as you can see here, this promotional exam for Company Officer 1, um, 2, and Chief Officer were developed specifically for fire agencies to determine 
the extent to which candidates possess the necessary job knowledge required for success as fire service supervisors. The exams were developed based on job analysis collected from fire departments across the nation. The job analysis results provided the empirical data for determining the relevant knowledge areas that are evaluated by fire company essentials examinations. And you can kind of see the, um, the measurement domains that are um, common across all three exams but are tailored to the specific exam. And as you can see, um, all three exams are 100 questions. You get two hours and 30 minutes plus 15 for instruction. And specifically, company officer one is first line supervisor position, specifically the rank of lieutenant, which is what we are discussing. And those measurement domains are EMS operations, tactical operations, building construction, tools, equipment, apparatus, supervisory principles, and incident management procedures. So what are the changes we're making? They are very few. Um, the vast majority of the current promotional procedures um, have stayed, um, as did PD, but what we did do was um, change the uh, return for competitive testing to specifically the rank of sergeant and lieutenant. Uh, I added a promotional process for the position of chief of staff, which was a new position that was created by the BOC but was not included in our procedures. Um, the promotional exam for both sergeant and lieutenant will, contest of a writ ex will consist of a written exam and an assessment center. The assessment center will consist of at least two job-related activities and some examples for sergeant. That would be a pumping exercise where, um, and all this is now conducted digitally and virtually. Um, they'll be given a pumping exercise to show us their proficiency with actually pumping one of our apparatus through a simulated incident and then an incident command scenario in which they are in charge of responding units to a fire ground. And then for the lieutenant, they will go through an advanced incident command scenario that typically gets more complex with fire victims and more building um, involved. And then they get thrown a role play exercise, um, which is always our favorite when we get to simulate um, personnel issues. Um, all the results and scoring are handled by human resources. The fire department is not involved in any of the testing process or scoring or rebuilding of the scores. Only the final banding is provided to the fire chief and that's once it has been done and certified by HR. Um, the highly qualified list is valid for 48 months. Qualified and not qualified are valid for 24. And the reason for that is if for some reason you find yourself on the qualified or not qualified, then you're basically not banned from future promotions for four years. Those lists will expire after two and you would be available to retest. So if you have a bad day and you wind up on not qualified, then in 24 months you can retest and hopefully get on that, that highly qualified list. So it, it kind of speeds up the process of, of the retest for those that do not wind up in highly qualified. Um, so why Sergeant and Lieutenant? Um, as you can see here, the rank of sergeant and lieutenant make up the bulk of our promotable billets. We currently have 89 sergeant's billets. We have 79 lieutenant's billets. Um, that makes up a total of 87% um, of the billets that require promotion um, to be placed in them. The remaining 13% are made up of captain, battalion, deputy chief, and assistant chief, and now chief of staff. Um, the billets that are in the 13% um, follow our current promotional procedures, which are based on best practices that are outlined in the 21st Century Fire and Emergency Services Study that was completed by our accrediting body. Specifically, it addresses Critical Issue B, Initiative 2, Item 1, um, which in that is um, Critical Issue B is under the heading of Culture. Initiative 2 um, reads, promote an, promote an organizational environment that is adaptable, open to change, innovative, and focused on continuous improvement. And item one um, states to select and promote leaders and managers in the organization who model the desired organizational behavior of self-assessment and continuous improvement. And I provided a copy of the promotional procedures for the board so you could see the red line revisions um, that are made. But um, these changes to this document, which are proposed at this time, um, will bring us in line with Clayton County Police Department and make our processes um, very similar. The only thing that changes is who administers the test. Um, outside of that, the process is about how it's done, banding, assignment to bands, promotions, everything else is identical. So with that, sir, that's as fast as I can go through it, so I will entertain any questions. And that last part that you just mentioned is done by HR, so it's the out entire of your hands is as well as the by HR. Hands. So the organization is not involved in, we don't even see the test scores, the test scores transmit from the company to HR. The only thing I get at the end of the process is a list of banded candidates from highly qualified, qualified, or not qualified. Um, the 
only time I get involved is if the HR director finds that there was some level of disparate impact somewhere in the process. She and I sit down, have a conversation about what that is and what her remedy is. We agree to that and then she moves forward, but the process is handled holistically by human resources. Sounds pretty much like the same process for the most part we used to have 15, 20 years ago. It's exactly the same process, sir. Okay. Anybody have any questions for the chief in reference to this presentation? Thank you, sir. Go to your next. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, the next one are some proposed modifications to Chapter 42, which is entitled Fire Protection and Emergency Medical Services, and this is in the official code of Clayton County. Um, and going through our annual or biannual review of our um, fees or our fire code, um, the fire marshal's office has identified a couple areas that we needed to fix due to conflicts with some state law. And then they um, have made some changes to our permit fee structure to bring us kind of in line with community development and the international building code um, in some areas and kind of how we, um, we administer our fee structure. So first up, our current ordinance that's in place under section 42-61.3, which is entitled Wear Installed. This is dealing with automatic fire sprinkler systems. Um, as you can see, the one that's highlighted in red um, Paragraph C in that says all new one and two family dwellings built closer than 15 feet from another structure or closer than 10 feet to the property line must be equipped with an approved automatic sprinkler system or constructed of non-combustible exterior masonry materials and must have protected openings. Um, we put this in several years back and it was as a result of cluster homes that were coming into the county built all out of vinyl siding. We were having issues with a structure fire that happens in the middle of the night and before you can blink your eye, you have five houses that are on fire um, simply because they're built right on top of each other and of combustible materials. So we added this code section in there to um, do one of two things, either drive the houses a little bit further apart um, so we do not have that radiant heat that sets one to the next to the next to the next, um, or make them to where they're built out of a non-combustible material with protected openings, i.e. no windows on facing sides so fire can jump from one window to the next, um, which does happen. So as going through our review, as we always do, we discovered that um, this provision by this Georgia code was made illegal. So in the 2018 Georgia code, um, the General Assembly passed um, this that basically says section 8-2-4, says neither the state residential and fire building code nor any residential and fire building code adopted by a political subdivision of the state adopted after May 24th of 2010 shall include a requirement that fire sprinklers be installed in a single family dwelling or residential dwell building that contains no more than two dwellings. So essentially we are prohibited from making our subdivisions safer. So um, what this um, request to change this ordinance does is basically, oops, it basically deletes what was paragraph C and makes paragraph D now paragraph C. So we basically just deleted that entire section from, um, from our code. One thing we did notice is that in the zoning ordinance um, under the subdivision design standards, they do have some similar setback requirements that should help us accomplish the same task. Um, assuming variances and stuff don't happen um, to allow those to get closer, but the provision we had was ruled a no-no. So we pulled it out. So we are prohibited from asking people to sprinkler their homes. Um, if it gets to three or more, that's considered a commercial building in a multifamily dwelling. So the rules change and we go to an apartment um, chapter in the code and now we're right back to enforcing it. But as long as it's a one or two family dwelling, can't do it. Um, moving forward, um, there's a couple of internal policies that we have had for years, but they've never been codified in the code. So we're simply adding some new sections. The first one is entitled 42-6, which covers Knox boxes. Um, basically, a lot of our buildings that we have in the county provide the fire department access to what's called either a Knox switch or a Knox box. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you remember we, several years, many, many years ago, we started requiring apartment complexes to install the Knox switch on all apartment gates so public safety can access the gates no matter what time or day. We all have keys that are custom cut to the county um, and they'll put that in, turn the key, the gate opens. And what that does is, as you know, apartment complexes change management like crazy. They change the gate codes. 911 can't keep up with it. So in the middle of the night, we can't get in. So this eliminates that. Um, what this article does though is allow us to, and a lot of businesses do this anyway, but 
this actually codifies it, but what this does is for large facilities, facilities that have special security measures, or whatever the case may be, this um, requires them to put a Knox box on the outside of their business, which gives us keys to the facility should we need them in the middle of the night. What this does is prevent us from causing damage to the building. If we get on a large warehouse with an active fire alarm, we can't see from one end to the other. We go through the front door, and a lot of times that means glass gets broke, doors get damaged, whatever the case means. This allows us to just open the door and go in. The um, key owner is notified anytime we access one of these bots so the key holder can come, um, but it allows us to access certain types of facilities without causing damage to them to make sure there's no immediate life hazard or active fire. Um, some cases prior to this, we've had fires that have raged in the back of warehouses and we just had no way of knowing it was burning. And it's hour and a half or two hours before a key holder can get to us and you know the damage that can be done in that amount of time. So. This just allows us to gain access to facilities um, without having to make our own um, access. The second um, code section goes back to the vehicle access gates, which was the knock switch that we talked about. So essentially this once again takes an internal policy that we had had and codifies it into the code that basically says if you're going to put up an autom a gate across a vehicle access gate that that has to have some sort of automatic um, operation or manually operation so we can get into it. Um, most of the time we'll have people that put up gates across access roads and we have no way to access through that gate. They're either padlocked, chained, um, or they have some other mechanical device that doesn't have the knock switch. So what this says is that the installation of vehicle access gates across fire apparatus road shall be approved by the chief of the county fire and emergency services department. Where those vehicle access gates are installed, they shall have an approved means of emergency operation. Um, the vehicle access gates and the emergency operation shall be maintained operational at all times. And then it kind of tells you um, what your four options are um, as, as how you can carry that out. But that's just to make sure that either we or law enforcement are not impeded from accessing a building by a vehicle access gate. And this only applies to what's deemed a fire apparatus road. So you can have four or five entrances into your facility and if they're not ones we deem necessary, then this would not apply. But for those ones that we mandate meet a certain standard for fire apparatus access, this would apply. Um, finally is the proposed changes to our fee structure. Um, what we did is we went back, as I said, and we made these um, kind of comply or, or be concurrent with, with kind of what the IBC says. Um, and we also restructured it so they're consistent throughout. So. Um, the only ones that are shown on the slide um, are the ones that we are, we are changing. And then of course I provided a full copy of the fee structure for the board for your review. But essentially under our certificate of occupancy inspections, we structured those to mirror our existing building inspections. Um, so this is how it's structured for our annual inspections. So we just mirrored that um, so that those would be consistent. Um, moving down to under construction plan review, the Previous fire sprinkler plan review um, had it listed just 0 to 10 heads or 11 to 50 or 51 to 100. We standardized this to be per system riser. So for every system riser um, you have, that fee applies and that's kind of how it's laid out um, in the International Building Code. And then down under um, F, which is Building Construction Inspection. Um, we added a 50% completion, which is required on a lot of our multi-story facilities. That was not in our previous um, inspections. And then because the 100% inspection is technically the certificate of occupancy inspection, we deleted that from section one, and then we changed bullet point two to first follow-up inspection, and then bullet point three is the second and subsequent follow-up inspections. Um, and then the final um, one that's on there that's hidden down here is um, under existing business and fire compliance inspection fees. Um, item C was more than 50,000 square feet and we added multifamily occupancies um, to that and that's kind of our plan is to ramp up um, the level of inspections we do on our apartment complexes and that's going back to the quality of life initiatives and everything that we've been doing um, in conjunction with PD um, and working with uh, Commissioner Franklin on some of our apartment complexes. So we've added um, that multifamily occupancy inspection fee to the existing business fire, com fire um, inspection fees. And then finally, we made one small change um, to the EMS fee structure. 
the way it's written now is we have a basic life support transport fee, we have an advanced life support, advanced life support two, and then critical care, transportation, and then our per loaded mile. All of these fees um, are in um, alignment with Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services and of course are adjusted periodically to compensate for the rate of inflation and the provision of additional services. The only thing we're doing here is we're deleting line item two um, and we're taking out the two in advanced life support two. So essentially we're just doing away with one fee and rolling it into one. So the new code structure geez, um, will just be basic life support, fee stays the same, advanced life support, transportation, fee stays the same, critical care and mileage per loaded mile. Essentially the reason we're doing this is our third party biller says that we rarely bill at the advanced life support level. Um, it's either basic life support or it qualifies for advanced life support too. So there was no longer a need to have another line item, another charge, another bill. It was overcomplicating the billing. So we just deleted it all together and simplified the structure. So it's either basic life support, advanced, or critical care. Um, it just simplifies it for our biller and simplifies it for our patients as well. And the requirements to hit each one of those are set by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So there's certain things we have to do. If we can't document that we do those, then we don't get to move up to that level. So that's all I have on the code ordinances and revisions. Okay. I'm just actually surprised that some of those issues and challenges have not been had not been addressed before now. Uh, I can see that being a big um, hurdle or barrier in terms of y'all being able to access buildings. Well, and, and, and like I said, Mr. Chairman, they've been internal policies. We've, we've been doing it, but one of the things that we noticed is within all of our codes, it says that a copy of that is on file in both my office and the clerk's office for review. But since it was not a part of the code, that policy didn't exist in the clerk's office. So um, our fire marshal brought that to us and said, hey, let's just go ahead, drop this in the code so it hits muni code. So as builders and developers are coming in and they're doing those code assessments, it's all right there and laid out for them. So, um, but it's been a challenge for, for years, even with it, you know, as a policy, so. Any questions from other commissioners? Uh, yes, I have a question. Commissioner Hamburg. Uh, yes, Chief. Um, in your, um, I think the Knotts box code section 42.6, does that apply to old apartment complexes since that's what we have a lot of in Clayton County? If they, if they have access control gates, yes, ma'am. Most of those, when we, when we implemented that policy um, many years ago, um, we went back and did make that policy retroactive. So um, if there's one out there that doesn't have it, um, then we will certainly go out there and look into that. But it does, um, on the access control gates, it does include those. And then, of course, anything new, um, is, it's a part of their construction process. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And it is their responsibility to maintain that. So as a part of their annual inspection, that's one of the first things that our inspector does is test that gate because they have to get into the complex. So they test the gate, and if the gate does not work, then that's one of the very first things. Um, I believe we have that listed as a critical failure item because that's if we can't get in, we can't do our job, and it's the same thing for law enforcement. You can oh. get in and just be some major damage. Oh, we can get in. Don't make no mistake about it. So our, our folk are, are, you know, they can get through a gate, but no doubt you're going to get a phone call if we do. That's all right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for your presentation, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Next up is economic development. I assuming that Commissioner Franklin is leading. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd ask for a couple of our lead developers to come and speak before us. I don't know if people remember, but um, a few, about a couple of years ago, we had Eugene come speak to us about the housing market and how we are faring against that housing market in Clayton County. And we've not had an update in a while. And it was brought to my attention that Eugene actually has been promoted and works in a different, for someone different and not no longer in that capacity. So um, the builder of the year, Chris Knight, who is actually from Clayton County, his family was raised in Clayton County and uh, continues to operate in Clayton as well as throughout the state of Georgia, brought up some very valid and um, poignant points that I thought would be 
pertinent to share with us um, to be in that space uh, so that we can get that housing update. And so if I could just ask for IT to please cue them up, then we would hear from both Chris Knight of uh, uh, previously Knight Builders. Now they're under a different name. The family has grown bigger. Uh, but uh, also we're gonna hear from Brad with Rock Haven Homes. I don't know if you all remember that builder. A builder previously only built north of I-20 and they have um, done a, a, what I've seen as a good job. And then um, the residents have even said it's been a good job after we get in to really negotiate the terms of that build. And so they're just gonna share some of their great experiences and what they feel that we can build on in Clayton County as we continue to expand our housing market in a quality fashion so that we can finally bring in those various restaurants and um, businesses. So with that, I'll throw it to the IT department to get them queued up. Um, Commissioner Franklin, I don't see Chris Knight on here. There isn't um, Atlanta Zoom room. And I put in a chat for him to raise his hand. Okay, there he is. There he is. I see Brad Hughes there. Brad is just muted. I, I see I, Brad. I think Chris is on now. Hey, this is Chris. How you Chris, doing, Chris? You tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, because I know too often we hear about developers not being from here and there are those like yourself who make us proud. So tell us a little bit about yourself before you tell us about um, some of your prized, um, I guess, work here. And I want to state this too. This is not germane to any district. Um, as, as I stated, Chris Knight is a number one builder in the state of Georgia. So he builds throughout all of Clayton County. So with that, Chris, I want to um, turn it over to you. Okay, hey, thank you so much for your kind words and thank y'all for your time. Um, my name is Chris Knight, formerly Knight Homes. Uh, we're currently joined with Dan Ryan Builders out of Maryland, uh, one of the top 25 builders in the nation. Uh, my dad and uncle started the company in 1978, had the opportunity to retire last year. And so uh, joining with Dan Ryan was, was one of the ways that we could uh, help them retire after 42 years. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I've been building in, in Clayton County since 78. I grew up in Clayton, uh, went to Point South Elementary, uh, Church Street Elementary, and then Riverdale Middle, and then Lovejoy High School. I still live just over the Hampton line on the Henry County side and uh, drive through Clayton every single day. So it was cool earlier to watch some of the presentation about the parks and rec. And, um, I, on my way to work in Fayetteville here, we uh, I drive past that River's Edge uh, Greenway area every day. I remember playing golf there, um, you know, 15 years ago or so before it closed. So a lot of memories. I had the opportunity to meet, uh, um, spend some time with uh, Ms. Franklin there at the, that Flint River Community Center. I'm not sure the proper name, but uh, at the open house, um, that was that was fantastic. So congratulations on just uh, some high quality things going on in the community. Uh, very impressive. Um, currently, we're building in three neighborhoods in Clayton County. Um, the lakes at Mundy's Mill, on Mundy's Mill Road, uh, Village Park in Ellenwood, and Town Center in Lovejoy, in the city of Lovejoy. Um, at three different price points, um, different lot sizes, in the, anywhere from the about 230000 up to about $320,000. I pulled some data, our Mondays Mill project and our Village Park project looks like have the highest average sales price of uh, new home communities in the county. So that was pretty cool. Um, and so we've been building here for a long time, enjoyed working in Clayton. One thing I wanted to do is compliment the building department. Uh, we work in about 20 different jurisdictions and uh, the permitting process is is very different everywhere. Um, and in Clayton, we can get a per building permit today in a week or two, which is still very, very quick and reasonable. Uh, the only county we work in that's faster than that is Gwinnett. And every other jurisdiction we work in is much slower than that. So thank you to the building department for, um, for that. Time is money in our, in our industry. Um, 
And so that we, we thank you for that. Uh, I did reach out to a couple of data sources uh, to get some information I thought you might be interested in real quick. Uh, one is Market Insight, uh, John Hunt, who does presentations similar to what um, Mr. James used to do. And I asked John about the market and Clayton, I said, hey, John, what would you uh, like to highlight? He said, well, what he would highlight is the current demand um, in Clayton County, we would need an additional 3,400 homes available for sale today in order to get back to equilibrium. And so what John's telling us is there's a deficit in Clayton County of about 3,400 homes today to get back to equilibrium. Um, and to contrast that, there were only 550 buildable home sites or lots sold in Clayton County in the last 12 months. And this is not a whole lot different than what we're seeing in other jurisdictions where the number of homes being sold is more than the number of homes being produced and the number of homes being produced is much higher than the number of lots or home sites that are being brought to the market. Um, so that's a, uh, the good news is demand is great. Uh, the bad news is supply is so low and there is such a shortage that prices are skyrocketing, uh, pricing many people out of the market. In addition to that, we've seen record high lumber increases among other cost increases. And so the, the, the current baseline for a detached single family home is very quickly approaching uh, the $300,000 mark above 300,000. Um, and townhomes are very quickly approaching the mid 200s at 240, 250 mark, just based on current cost and uh, increased land, increased development cost and increased housing cost. Um, one of the things that is, uh, that I thought might be worthy of highlighting um, quickly is the timeline. Um, we have, we're starting with a shortage and we project to take a brand new piece of property from zoning, if we have to get new zoning on a piece of property, all the way until a house is ready to sell on that property, it takes anywhere from 27 to 33 months. So it's over two years and hopefully less than three years. And so if we bring a project before you today uh, for zoning, um, we've already put six to nine months of planning and, and um, engineering into that project. And then we come before the board and then we're looking at it being um, almost another two years after that zoning before a house would be, would be ready for sale. So the process is very, very long. It's very, very expensive. Um, and so one of the things, you know, a few things that developers talk about that, that would help affordability uh, one is lot sizes and home sizes, um, because as costs continue to increase, it, it does help to have flexibility in those areas. And then secondly is just the development timelines themselves. Um, getting tabled is, is uh, very, very difficult. Uh, we have a project today we will bring before you guys in another month or two called Genesis Towns. Uh, Ms. Battles representing us, Steve Moore, Moore Bass is our engineer. So we have not even brought it to a zoning hearing yet, and we've already spent over $90,000 on this project in testing, engineering, planning, um, environmental um, tests, uh, all, all types of things. And so before we even get to the hearing, you know, it's not uncommon for a developer to spend 50 to 100 plus thousand dollars, not even knowing if the project is going to be uh, approved or denied. Um, and so the communication, we're always available, and I think all builders and developers are always available for communication, always available for questions. As much as we can learn and respond to prior to um, those meetings, which determine our fate, we, we would gladly appreciate the feedback, gladly uh, appreciate having a seat at the table um, and, and feel like we can always arrive at a, at a solution that is a win-win for the county and also for 
of the company that's that's making the proposal. Um, those those are really the highlights that I had. Um, one other thing, I did pull some data from Smart Numbers. I thought this was interesting. Uh, last year, there were almost 900 new homes in Clay, new home closings in Clayton County. In t in the year 2000, 21 years ago, there were over 2,000 new home closings in Clayton County. So as busy as it seems and as robust as the market seems today, we are way below um, where things were even 20 years ago uh, with regards to housing production and, uh, and lot production, production in the metro Atlanta area, uh, which is driving the, the cost up even, even further. So um, we need lots, the, the development community needs lots, the home buying public, there's, there's definitely demand for, for housing in Clayton County and all this, the Southern Crescent counties um, and really that lot supply and the ability to get uh, collaborate, then get deals approved and bring lots to market faster is going to be key as we, uh, as we move forward. Okay, before we uh, move to Brad, just have one question for you, sir, and that is what incentives, if any, are you seeing in the market to address the supply issue that you uh, mentioned just a little earlier? Uh, what incentives? Yeah, are there any incentives out there that you know of or that you have seen in the market to address the the shortage? And yeah, that's a good issue? question. Um, I don't I don't know of any. I know that there are federal opportunity zones and things to uh, to supply tax incentives, which uh, w which are interesting. Um, I don't I don't know a, enough about that. Other than that, I don't know of any local incentives. Um, in most places we work, uh, the timelines have gotten much longer and the costs have gotten much greater. Um, you know, the specifications, not, not, not really on the houses, but on the development infrastructure and on the things like street widths, things that, that, that would, we could collaborate on ways to save not only our cost to date that we could pass on to buyers, but also future maintenance costs for municipalities. Um, but as far as just just incentives off off the shelf, I don't I don't know of any. Okay, thank you, sir. Let's hear from Mr. Hughes. Hey, Mr. Chairman, thank you all for your time. Uh, this is Brad Hughes, of Rock Haven Homes, and uh, I appreciate uh, y'all having. Uh, Chris and I and I, uh, tonight speak before you all. Chris uh, made several uh, great points um, uh, earlier. And, and, you know, Clayton County is a, is a, is a great place uh, to build in and continue in our, in our minds, you know, in the foreseeable future, a hotbed for the housing uh, market. It's close in uh, to the airport and, uh, and see the land up and everywhere around there with the interstate systems all the you know job growth um, in Clayton County and around uh, you know Clayton that you can be you know 15 to you know 20 to 30 minutes uh, to, you know multiple different industries uh, you know it's a huge uh, benefit uh, we had been in, in Clayton County near as long as uh, Chris and his family but we started looking at uh, buying deals in Clayton County probably four years ago and uh, you know started off probably 70 lots you know now we're up around 2,000 lots we have uh, either own or uh, have control of in Clay County. So we, uh, you know, we think it's a, it's a great, uh, you know, community and county to be in. And, and, and a lot of that, uh, you know, is leadership um, of y'all and, uh, you know, at the county level too uh, during the permitting process. Like Chris said earlier, uh, y'all's permitting process is, is, is great um, to be able to have the plans submitted and turned around. I think we lost them a little bit. You know, in a week, to, you know, once that time, uh, you know, get permits. So, uh, you know, the more uh, that is. Uh, Mr. Hughes, your connection you is fading in. in and out. Well, if I met Mr. Chairman, I think that he's actually hit all the highs. And 
you know, Chris being that he's from Clayton County, so he just came and was just an amazing show off tonight. So I think he hit all the high points as well. But first of all, I want to say congratulations to both Chris as well as to Brad. Both of their companies have been extremely um, cognizant of our county and the, um, the means in which our county is wishing to grow. Both of those um, folks have come to the table to ask, what can we do to move forward? Um, again, the reason I asked for this update again tonight is because we've had an update several years ago. And I feel it's extremely important that as we continue to have aspirations to grow economically, that we address the very um, components of that growth, which is housing, the housing market, the ever changing housing market and availability of housing. And then also addressing the fact that in Clayton County, we've got to come into balance between our renters and our homeowners. So um, I know that some time ago, we approved um, a uh, code that would allow for more home, home ownership. And I can tell you that these two that are here online with us are definitely for it. They're seeing folks come in and what prompted this specifically is Chris said, uh, you know what, Felicia, it may take two years for us to get to the point that the house is ready to sell. He said, but I have no issues with selling it. And um, as he shared with you, a housing market is doing very well in Clayton County. There's definitely potential for even more growth. And we need to continue to expand and expound upon that. Um, also, Mr. Chairman, I remember you stated a question to Chris earlier. I don't know that, the, um, and it was a great question, but more so than opportunities, what we have to do is have a better understanding of what it takes for us to grow economically and the housing market itself that's ever changing. And with that being stated, that opportunity is simple of allowing for more, not just new homeowners, but those who are retiring. And if I may just end this presentation with this, there's a jewel that I believe that Clayton County would benefit from really uh, marketing even more, and that is our seniors. And that's our senior citizens. You know, years ago, Florida was a place to go and retire. Well, people are getting tired of dealing with the hurricanes and, and the unpredictable weather, which we do deal with some here. But what we're noticing, and, and I know Chris and even Brad probably attest to it, that our population may be getting older by age and indigent, but these 70 year olds like um, Mama Ansley and all those folks, they'll dance the night away and put you to shame, all of y'all to shame. So my point of saying that is Clayton County has the only nationally accredited senior services so we need to look at marketing our homes to folks who have that expendable income, who can come in and take out, let's say, a hundred thousand other retirement and come in and buy a piece of property, because that is your biggest investment in life. So I really hope that we can take this information and build upon it. And I just thank the two gentlemen for coming. I thank them for coming to the Communities on the Rise event and coming every year. And I look forward to us building together because the time to come before our board is not just when we're approving zoning, but it's all it all begins with relationships at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Thank you for that. Are there any questions for Brad or Chris before we let, the, let them go? All right, gentlemen, thank you for your presentation and thank the information. Thank you all so much. Yes, thank you all. Sorry about my connection. I apologize. No problem, no problem. No problem at all, Brad. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you all. Yes. Thank you, Chris, for your time. Yes, ma'am. Thank y'all. Keep making us proud, y'all. Next discussion point is Alzheimer's Service Center. Ms. Tori Tanks. Good evening. Good evening. One of the things that I I'm really big on is the why. Um, I've had several people ask me, Tori, why are you so passionate about seniors? Why are you so passionate about your job? Why are you so passionate about what you do? And sometimes I think it's important to understand the why. So I'm not gonna take long. I have a couple of, I have quite a bit of slides, but they're really quick. But I do wanna take a second just to talk to you about my why and why I stand before you to do this presentation. Um, when I was at Hampton University, all I wanted to do was work in the senior center. I did an internship at Northampton Senior Center in Hampton, Virginia, 
And that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to work in a senior center, and I wanted to give back. The main reason I wanted to do that is because my grandmother, who raised me while my mom was in college, developed early onset Alzheimer's. And then my great-grandmother, who also lived in the house with us, she developed dementia. And at the same time, my grandfather ended up with lung cancer. My family made a decision that they were not going to put my grandparents into a nursing home. Um, this was a decision that um, it was very hard. My grandmother getting Alzheimer's, she was the rock of our family. It shook our family to the core. But my mom and her siblings, they made a decision to pull together their resources. And we paid someone to come into our house and take care of our grand my grandparents. Um, this was a lot. My mom was um, in her final years of teaching. She had to miss a lot of work because she had to stay at home to take care of my grandmother, who was declining in health. Um, we ended up having to pay the person who lived in our home Monday through Friday from 8 to 5.30. We had to pay her salary plus her insurance and benefits. Um, this was very hard on our family. So for me, working in a senior center was going to be my way of giving back. Little did I know, being so young and naive, that senior center jobs have a low turnover rate. And my mom's like, you need to figure this out because I can't continue to provide you money to live in Virginia. And so what ended up happening, I could find a job on the recreation side working with youth, teens, and adults. So I transitioned over to Parks and Rec and absolutely loved working there. Came to Clayton County, worked diligently, helping get some of the rec centers open. Absolutely loved it. I also moved back to, when I moved back to Atlanta, the reason was to also help my parent, my mom take care of my grandparents. What ended up happening, life has its way. Sometimes we make our plans, but life has a whole other plan. I was not looking to go to senior services. Clayton County made a decision that senior services was going to be its own department, and just like a chess piece on the board, I went to senior services. Was I looking to go to senior services? No. Was I heartbroken because I had to leave Parks and Rec? You bet I was. But in that small, still voice, it said to me, this is something you prayed about when you were doing your internship. This was something that you asked for. You said you wanted to advocate. You said you wanted to be there for seniors. You talked about your grandparents. I come from a small town, Ty Ty, Georgia. There was no daycare center. I was raised by older relatives. My, my Aunt Sarah, who passed away at almost 100, she was my after school program. All of my grandparents were alive up until I turned 30. I had a step, two step grandmothers, great grandmothers, grandmas, everybody in my family lived a long time, except for my grandmother who developed early onset Alzheimer's and she died very young. So my why has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with anything other than advocating for a group of people who cannot advocate for themselves. So in the January 12th work session, you guys, we were talking about one thing and then my passion kind of jumped in and made me start talking about the Alzheimer's Service Center. That same passion that rose up on January 12th is still there. I met with the Alzheimer's <coughs> Service Center as you directed to find out exactly what would be needed um, to assist ASC with becoming financially stable, whether that meant bringing them up under senior services whether that meant providing funding to them. In my research, um, it was a lot. Um, this program has been suffering for a while. It's not something that just happened. It's just been a trickle down effect where they're at the point now where they're facing the doors being closed. Mm -hmm. And so as I met with Sylvia <coughs> Dennis, who's the current manager of ASC, I had to unravel the pieces. I had to read the audit. I had to kind of look at some things because, you know, I, I don't really deal in gossip. Um, I like to go to the facts and find out what's going on. Um, I've heard several things about ASC not being fiscally responsible, um, which is why they're in the shape that they're in. So many different things. So I took it upon myself to do some thorough research and put together a presentation for you guys. So I'm going to talk about ASC's purpose, the statement of need, their advisory board, the program overview, fees and charges, proposed staffing, the proposed budget, outstanding facility needs and options. This is not going to take very long. I know it's late and we all want to get to our families. Um, so Jamie, so the purpose, um, the Alzheimer's Service Center provides adult day services, overnight respite services, 
caregiver support services, and telehealth services for seniors suffering from Alzheimer's, other dementias, and their caregivers. At present, the Alzheimer's Service Center, as is well known as ASC, is in financial peril and, and will have to close its doors permanently. In 2015, ASC's funding was reduced by $184,000. And this is the misnomer. We've had several conversations, people saying that ARC pulled the funding. So I spoke with ARC directly just so I can provide you some factual information. What happened in 2015, ARC changed their model. So as you know, ARC, they provide funding to us from federal and state. Um, older Americans add funds and state funds to us to provide services, in-home services for seniors and in our senior centers. Well, at the time, the director in 2015 decided that they no longer wanted to fund brick and mortar buildings. They would fund the services, but not brick and mortar buildings. This 184,000 represented some of that. So they changed their model. So what needed to happen was, ASC needed to apply for the service model, and that didn't happen. Um, didn't happen for reasons that I really don't know, but ARC changed the model, and that's why they lost the funding. Um, since then, the center has not been able to rec recoup the loss of this funding. So each year, they're constantly scaling back, trying to just figure out how they can make it work. Right now, the advisory board, um, they have an advisory board, one of the things in my, um, in my presentation you're going to see is I'm going to talk about proposed changes and I'm going to kind of talk about where they are. And part of this is, this whole presentation is if ASC were, were to come up under senior services. So when I say proposed changes, these are changes that I'm recommending for financial, for financial sustainability of the program. So at present there is an advisory board. In my recommendation, I would leave the advisory board intact. At present, the chairman is State Representative Mike Glanton. The vice chair is Attorney Sam Foster, and there are two members. I would make some proposed changes to this. Um, I would add a secretary and a treasurer. I think everyone understands why you need a secretary and a treasurer on the board, and I think the offices should have term limits. You need fresh new people in there sometimes just to make good decisions. At present, this is not a board-appointed board. That would be at the board's pleasure if you decided to make this um, a board that you guys appoint like other organizations that you assign board members to. So the program overview. Adult day, um, ASC provides adult day services, overnight respite, and telehealth services. The facility opens from 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. There is weekend respite, which is Friday at 4.30 p.m. to Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. A lot of people say, why do you need weekend respite? Anyone that knows if you're dealing with someone that has Alzheimer's or dementia, you need respite. Um, my mom was not able to take vacations. She couldn't come to Virginia to visit me while I was there because she was tied to my grandparents. Had she had a program like this, she could have put my grandparent, my grandmother, um, my great-grandmother there, and she could have easily come to visit me. <coughs> so this is weekend respite. At present, ASC is not providing weekend respite. It has not provided weekend respite in a long time due to staffing, staffing issues. Um, ASC provides meals, structured social, recreational, therapeutic group activities, medical, monitoring, counseling, long-term long care planning, and an interactive, safe, and secure environment. The care provider may allow these individuals to delay nursing home placement, and that is a fact. Anytime that you have someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia and you put them in a safe, caring, nurturing environment, it does a prolong or delay them going into full-blown Alzheimer's or other um, related dementias. It, is, it enables family caregivers to remain in the workforce. Had my mom had the luxury of having this, it would have saved our family tons of money. Um, some of my family members had to go into their retirement fund to be able to take care of my grandparents. Telehealth services are now offered. These are services that began during the pandemic. Some of the services being offered are planned activities, therapeutic activities, and um, meals are being provided. But as you know, that's difficult for someone with Alzheimer's to do um, telehealth and log into a computer. So their caregiver really has to help them participate in telehealth services. So I have a proposed change here. Um, I really think that the hours should be more like 7 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. Not that I'm comparing a senior to daycare, but daycares are, are in place for working parents. This center needs to be in place for working caregivers. So if you open the center from 7 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m., then that means I can take my loved one to ASC and drop them off, and by the time I pick, get off from work, I can pick them up. So there are two models. There's a medical model and a social model. 
At present, ASC is operating on a medical model. Um, the medical model, it provides more intensive services such as on-site nursing care and medica medication management. Um, full personal care, showers, continuous care, and eating. So you gotta think about someone with Alzheimer's and dementia. These are things that they have uh, uh, issues doing. They can't take medication for themselves. They have to be reminded to take their medicine. Um, sometimes they have continence issues. Sometimes you have to prompt them to eat. You have to help them if they have an accident to take a shower. So right now, ASC is operating on the medical model. The medical model is a tad bit more expensive because you need to have a registered nurse and you need to have a licensed practic practical nurse on site. Um, if ASC became, came under senior services, we could look into a social model or we can do a combo because there are some social models out there where you could have just an RN to administer medicine or an LPN to administer medicine, but that definitely would be something that we would take a look at if, a little later, if the board decided that ASC should come under senior services. So there are two levels. So you have two different participant levels. A level one is a participant that is very independent and requires minimal supervision. When my grandmother first um, developed Alzheimer's, she was pretty functional. Um, she can do things for herself, she could eat, she can do what she needed to do. But as the disease progressed, not so much. So then she went into a level two state. So level two participant requires help with daily living activities such as eating activities and using the bathroom or continence. The program overview. The program capacity is 50. So you think that's a really small number. However, you can serve more than 50 people because not everyone is gonna come or need service Monday through Friday. Some participant comes Monday and Tuesday, some come Monday and Wednesday and Friday, some may only come once a week, or some may just come for a weekend respite. So you could actually serve more than 50, but the capacity of the building is 50, and you can only accommodate five people for weekend respite. At present, there are 28 participants enrolled at ASC. 19 are Clayton County residents, and nine, and nine are non-county residents. I'm proposing to do something like an 80-20. Um, it doesn't matter where you live. If you need a service, you need a service. But I do know the board has mentioned time and time to, again about is ASC accommodating county residents or non-county residents? And so I'm proposing that we do something like an 80-20 or a 90-10, but if we do an 80-20, 55 of the participants, um, I mean 44 participants would be Clayton County residents and 11 would be non-county residents. Fees and charges. So you have three different things going on at ASC. You have private pay participants. These are people who they do not qualify for Medicaid or Medicare, they're paying directly out of their pocket. And then you have a program called CCSP, which is Community Care Service Program, and it's a reimbursement program. ASC is, ASC is doing fairly well with that because when they have a participant that qualifies for Medicaid, that money is then reimbursed back to ASC. And then there's also SOURCE, and that's the same thing. It's a reimbursement program, it's just that some of the nuances and the financial requirements are a little bit different but those funds are reimbursed directly back to ASC. ASC. Weekend respite fees are $500 per weekend. These are fees that also could be reimbursed as well through CCSP and source. And then also, if a senior makes a healthy amount of income, the $500 would not be a problem. This is ASC's current sliding fee scale. So as you can see, if I make $10,000, I pay $40 a day. Sounds good, but this is really difficult. Um, this has caused some of the financial difficulties that ASC is facing because um, $40 a day, that is a lot. If I need to come every day, that's $200 a week. The average senior cannot afford that. Um, and it's based upon the senior's income, not the caregiver or the family income. And it, then it goes on and on up to, you know, just increases by increments of life. So I am proposing to move away from a sliding fee scale in this instance. Typically, that's not something that you would do, but move away from a sliding fee scale and implementing like private paid monthly resident fees or private paid monthly non-resident fees. This is something that we definitely would have to massage as we go. Um, I can't really give you hard numbers right now, but this is definitely something that would mitigate, mitigate some of the financial issues they're having because honestly, what has also happened to ASC um, when you're talking about someone with Alzheimer's and dementia, it tugs at the heartstrings, so sometimes seniors have been allowed to participate in, with the promise to pay later, um, and that has not happened. If this program became up under senior, senior services, I do believe in accountability, 
and I do believe in holding people accountable for what they owe and what they should pay. And I know it sounds really hard, but at the same time, this is a business that we will have to run to make sure that people who are participating in the program are actually paying those fees. The current staffing, because they have whittled away to nothing, there's just an executive director, Ms. Sylvia Dennis, she's here. She's the current executive director. Um, she's wonderful to work with. She took the time to sit down with me and answer all my questions about operations. And as you know, our assistant director, Melissa Breyer, Melissa Myers Bristol, she used to be the executive director at ASC. So with the wealth of knowledge from both of them, um, I was able to gather all the information that I needed. So they currently have a di dietary manager that's on staff and two program aides. I'm proposing to move away from the dietary manager because there are some resources that we have in senior services and that's something that we could probably contract out, the meal program, like how we contract them out and other services that we provide. And this is an organizational chart that I put together and proposing. Um, we will have a center manager. Let me back up just a second. As not to create a parity issue with the staff that we already have, we did have to make some staff changes. Whereas Sylvia Dennis' title now is executive di director, it will become a center manager. And so as not to create parity issues with the staff that we already have, we went with similar titles that we already have in senior services. So there will be a center manager with the admin secretary for support because with a program of this nature and a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of reimbursement, there's a lot of different nuances to um, reconciling and doing paperwork at the facility. Um, one program coordinator, a registered nurse, which is a requirement, a, a LPN, which is also a requirement, a case manager. The case manager is important because our seniors need to know, um, if we have seniors that call the facility, they may not know about CCSP and SOURCE and how to apply for the voucher program. The case manager will help them navigate through those services um, so they can apply for the voucher program. A ASC site coordinator is what we're proposing, and that's someone that will coordinate the meal service that I talked about meaning that we would contract meals in, we wouldn't actually be prepping meals on site, they would be contracted in and they would meet the dietary restrictions and guidelines for adult day health. We're proposing to have program aids, level two program aids. The level two speaks back to the slide before where I explained to you what level two care is. A level two program aid is equivalent to that of a CNA worker. Um, overnight LPN respite and overnight, two overnight LPN respite workers, that's two licensed practice or nur practical nurses to work in the res weekend respite program. And so all of this staff is what would be needed to put ASC back in a proper functioning state. So now I'm just going to talk to you about the budget. Um, the projected income for ASC, as you can see where it says Georgia Department of Community Health, that's the CCSP and source program that I spoke to you about. They receive roughly $165,000 a year from that. Um, the Georgia Department of Early Care, that's a reimbursement program for, um, meal, for snacks and food from right from the start. Participant fees, this is pretty good. I mean, you have, they're bringing in $90,000 in participant fees, and that's based off the slide fee scale that I mentioned to you earlier. And then everything else is just additional grants, fundraising opportunities, under senior services, there could be more opportunities, there could be resource sharing with grants that we already receive, um, and like the fundraising golf tournament, there would be ways that we could actually support ASC to have a bigger tournament to raise more money. So the total income for ASC is $303,571. Projected operational expenses. So this is everything that I spoke to you about. The part-time and the full-time salaries, it comes up to um, $426,000, part-time $199,000. And then there are, of course, there are all of the supportive line items to run the facility. These are comparable to our senior centers and how they op operate. And actually, the total amount is pretty much equivalent to the cost, it co the cost of operating a senior center. And that continues. And so when you look at it, the total operational expenses at ASC is $686,301. And the total income is $303,571, which puts ASC in the red, $382,730. This has been going on for years and years and years, which is where we are, why we are where we are now, that the center cannot um, operate. Now, of course, there's some other stuff going on. 
because ASC has not been able to fully operate, there is deferred maintenance. There are several things in the facility that need to be fixed. Grounds and landscape, and when you ride back there now, it just doesn't look good. It doesn't look good for the county. It just does not, doesn't look good. The fencing needs to be replaced. Outdoor furniture needs to be replaced. The front awning needs to be repaired or replaced. Front doors need to be repaired. The alarm system is outdated. The fire system needs servicing. The HVAC system needs servicing. Kitchen appliances need to be replaced. The entire building needs painting and cleaning. Outdoor furniture needs to be replaced and windows need to be repaired. I did not have enough time to get quotes <laughs> to come up with the dollar amount <laughs> for all of this. So we have options. Option one is we can do nothing. We can just do nothing and which will lead to the center closing and seniors and caregivers being displaced. Option two, the county could provide ASC with ongoing, ongoing funding in the amount of $382,730. This option does not lead to sustainability because it's based upon the board and a vote every year and you just never know how that's gonna go. Option three is agree to bring ASC under senior services providing $382,730 which has strong potential to, to decrease due to resource sharing. Mm -hmm. One of the things I can say is when I became the director of senior services, I cut our budget myself by almost a half million dollars. And that was just something that being fiscally responsible as a director, it was something that I knew that we needed to do. Um, I'm not making any promises. If you decided to put ASC under senior services that I could get ASC to a break even point, but I can promise you this, the red would not be 383000 But initially, that is what would be needed to support the program for a year until our staff can really figure out what's going on and how to unravel it. And that concludes my presentation. Okay. Does Very informative. <coughs> yes, plenty of questions. Plenty. All right, the first question that I have is I would like to see, well, it's not a question, it's a statement here the outstanding or the needs for the improvement of the center. Those quotes or estimates in terms of getting it up to running. Uh, second question is, is there any money owed by the center to anybody? As of right now, no. The prop there's no mortgage on the building. The land, the property is all there from the audit that I have looked at. I did send a request from State Representative Glennon and Mr. Foster some information about the land and how that would have to be turned over to the county. Um, I have not received that information as of yet, but as of right now, there's nothing that's owed. All the bills are paid. Um, it's just a deferred maintenance and... Are you familiar with any other counties that have taken on an Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's uh, center? within their senior services department or under their general budget? Um, no, this is not something that um, is normal um, because other, center, other counties don't have an Alzheimer's service center. This is a jewel. Mm. This is something that's new. It's something that our county should be proud of. Um, a lot of other counties are interested in possibly using ASC. You spoke about me doing some research on a model, a regional model. I can't even begin to look at a regional model until the foundation of the center is established. So it's kind of like we got to go back to square one and kind of do some rebranding and kind of get things established. And then that's a possibility because that will require us sitting down at the table with a Fayette or Henry and talking about how we can pull together resources to make this a regional center. Um, the center has um, enough room to increase the footprint of the building at some point because the capacity is 50. So it doesn't make sense to go into a regional model when you can only really have a max capacity of 50. Um, but that would be at the board's pleasure to determine about that. All right, my last question is for the COO, Ms. Staff. Could any of the money from the American Rescue Plan be leveraged to as a bailout? Uh, would it qualify? Yes, sir, it would. It would qualify. It would qualify. And that money would sustain, it'd be sustainable for what, three years? Three years. Um, um, the infusion, our $30 million will certainly probably hit us in the next 30 to 45 days, and then we should get another infusion of about $33 million sometime next year. So, um, But money has to be allocated by that three-year period. Um, 
And so, yeah, we'll have about a three-year window in, in which we'll have to have money infused to allocate for whatever projects. But um, the Strader's uh, presentation, it would qualify based upon um, health needs within the community. And if the board did choose to uh, take this on, then three years would give us time to try to find some alternative uh, funding sources to try to sustain it if this is something we wanted to do. So thank you. I appreciate your answer. Are there any other questions for Ms. Tanks? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Hambrick. Commissioner, um, Commissioner Hambrick. I go ahead. have a couple of questions and, and, and some other thought questions too. But um, Ms. Strada, has this been a state agency before prior to or uh, how have they been funded? Okay, so I can only provide the information as far as I know. It has been a combination. It hasn't been a solely state funded. Um, ASC has received services for funding from the county. They have received federal and state dollars from ARC at one point. And then they also received grant funding from other sources. So it has been a combination, but I, it does follow under the state guidelines of an adult day center. Okay. Um, this information you've given us, has our CFO reviewed any of this? I have not reviewed it directly with Ramona, but I did send it to finance to, to pull the numbers for the salary amounts to make sure that those numbers were correct, but I have not provided directly to Ms. Um, Bivens at all. Okay, and I know you say that they are close to closing the doors and all this. I, I just don't see us making that kind of decision as far as taking on a whole nother agency that in that short time uh, and i know the coo just said something about three years that allow but we're talking about years and years of, of, of service and all now i have family members and all not I, I mean i feel you and the things that you've said and what you've experienced and all that but i just think this is a decision that the board really really needs to take seriously um, consideration. I mean, we need an audit. We need, I mean, you, you're going to have to have, uh, I would just jot some things down. You're going to have to have medical staff. Uh, and and it, it's going to open us up, I think, for a lot of uh, lawsuits and all, too. I mean, oh, let's, I'm just trying to name some of these things that I've written down here. Uh, the medical services, the staffing, auditing, uh, reviewing the records, um, open up for lawsuits, um, and as far as um, uh, I think I said something about the state agency already, I, I just think this is something that that needs a lot of questions and answers and uh, research and review and professional uh, advice and all uh, before we take on something like this. Now, I can see where we were in the past assisting financially. I don't have a problem with that, but as far as taking it on as a either another agency or putting it on under our senior services and all, and I'm listening to and trying to see how it differs from our aging uh, uh, organization that we have right now. Um, how, how does this differ? I mean, I know you said the overnight thing and all. I, this is just so many questions here. I just can't start to uh, to to to. Uh, try and answer or get you to answer right now. And I, I, it's not a quick fix, let me just say that. Uh, but for now though, if you don't mind telling me the difference between our aging uh, operation and this, the ASC. So our aging program is services for seniors who are homebound. These are seniors who are non-ambulatory and they cannot leave their home. So we provide services to them. We come in and we provide meals on wheels. We do personal care. And that's where we, a CNA worker goes into the home and provides personal care, bathing, feeding, combing up the hair. And then we also provide homemaker services. The CNA worker comes into the home, cooks a meal, does the furniture, vacuums the floor, and does all of that. That is for those seniors who cannot leave their home. This particular program is for seniors who have dementia and Alzheimer's. They're still functioning. Still functioning. They can take care of themselves in some instances. They may be a level two. They may need a little bit more care but they can leave their homes and they still can enjoy life. They still can get out and do what they need to do. They just need some assistance. I, 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 again, you know, thank you for your presentation and all that, but I just think this needs a lot of, of uh, research 
uh, questions answered, auditing, and it, it, just a lot of things. And I don't want us to bite off too much that we can chew. And right now, I just don't see us being able to chew this. And maybe somebody can come in and tell me something differently, but I just don't see it right now. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. First of all, Tori, let me say thank you for just your dedication. Just it shows your passion shows and how you work and just the words you use and how you move through all these different decisions. So just thank you for what you do. And I love that HBCU background because it just shows in your presentation and your org charts. Don't get upset, Chairman. But um, I agree with Hamrick in one point that we do have to do our due diligence in making sure that we can accommodate this correctly. But I do know this, the way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. We owe it to our seniors to begin to assist them in any way that we financially, reasonably financially can. And so we're for that. Um, I've spoken to Ms. Dennis several times throughout the past on some of the issues that are having, that they are having, and I'm all for trying to figure out how to um, better service this or this area of need one of the something that i wanted you to touch on a little bit more was <clears throat> through the sharing of resources with the senior center how much from i'm not saying a dollar amount but from a percentage standpoint um that you can begin to offset some of their costs through the sharing of resources well one way we can do that is i did reach out to arc and so i did asked for guidance before I did this presentation. I reached out to ARC and I spoke to other people who have a dope day centers just to talk about some things. ARC um, has explained to me that our current, the, the current funding that they provide to us, ASC is eligible to receive a lot of that funding. With us coming upon the NOFA, the notice of available funding from ARC in the next two year period, we could ask for money for, from the Older Americans Act um, grant to support ASC. The issue is a a a ASC has not been able to apply for that funding because this funding is for the AAA, it's for Clayton County. So we would be able to ask for funding under the OAA, Older Americans Act administration fund to support ASC. We actually have funding in this budget year to support ASC. Um, ARC granted us permission, permission to use some of our funding, but COVID happened. And so because <coughs> the me. members were not going to ASC, we could not use that OOA funding to provide service to supplement at, a at ASC. The acronyms are getting mixed up. Okay. Um, also, and, uh, and you kind of went into some, but are there any other subsidies that you know about, or even Ms. Dennis knows about, that we can begin to use to offset some of these costs? if? you were brought in under the county or some sort of um, subsidiary model uh, thereof? Well, there is tons of funding out there, especially when you're talking about Alzheimer's and dementia, there's funding out there that you can apply for. Um, there's HUD funding, it, it, it's, a, it's eligible for all of that. So it's just a matter of us just taking a look at it. Okay. Um, now that we're a member of the National Council on Aging through our accreditation, they have grants that you can apply for. Um, actually, as a matter of fact, ASC would be a prime model on a national level for them to do some research. Um, there are research opportunities with the National Council on Aging to apply for funding, to do some <coughs> research there. So there are a plethora of resources that um, we can look into to um, support ASC. Great, great. As opposed to depending on the county for the full 350. All righty. Well, thank you, thank you. And also, too, Ms. Dennis, we would be remiss if we did not say we were doing sponsoring the golf tournament June 28th to begin to raise money for the Alzheimer's Center. So I don't know that website to go on. If Ms. Dennis could give it to us before we get out of here, I appreciate that. Well, we'll make sure it's on our website, definitely, if it's not already there. Any other questions? Well, I, I don't have a question, Mr. Chairman, but I would like to make a suggestion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Strada was just saying all these funding sources are out there. Uh, what's prohibiting um, ASC from applying for, you know, these different funding, uh, go through these different funding sources and, uh, and remain uh, their own entity 
with the assistance, including, again, county, state, federal, and these grants and other funding sources that are out there. Well, the state that ASC is in right now, there are only three staff there. Um, it has dwindled down to just three people. So you're talking about three people doing the research and trying to find grants. Um, just by default of being under a county department um, would lend ASC to a lot of resources that the county is eligible for as opposed to ASC just being its own separate entity. Not to say that the option that you put out there could not work. For me, it's not about it coming under senior services or not coming under senior services. For me, it's about us not letting that, that program um, just dwindle away. So whatever capacity the board decides that we need to support ASC, I think it's a win-win for everybody. Can I ask this question Chair, to you, Chairman? Is, would there be any way for us to begin to provide some sort of grant writer or some type of grant writing functions and research functions to ASC to begin to research this? Number one, we don't even have a grant writer. Well, Our department you know, does that yeah. research themselves. Uh, but that nothing keeps the ASC board from finding somebody and asking them to do the same. Maybe they'll do a pro bono or um, as a charitable uh, 501c organization to donate their services for uh, that purpose. So I would employ them to at least look at that to your point about seeking out some additional funds. Yeah. And that might be something they've already done or tried it at some point in time as well. So I won't speak for her, but yes, that, that would be a good recommendation. Questions? Okay, so if you would just provide those, some additional information. Uh, as Commissioner Hambrick has said, it's a lot to digest and a lot to have to vet on a short period of time. But if you could tell us about what it would take to bring a lot of those uh, repairs up at the center I want to see those as well as any other funding sources uh, grants grant opportunities that if it fell on the county side uh, what department or what grants will be available if you know and I think uh, I think that was I thought you had said something else what was it uh, it was just about the grants or the okay well we covered that and uh, that would be a start uh, do we have a date that they might have to shutter the doors um i was told at the end of this month end of this month which is a week yes mm -hmm. wow okay i don't know if that's a realistic timeline but uh we'll take that under advisement all right is there anything else Thank you for your presentation, and as Commissioner Hambrick has said, your passion for the uh, seniors and all that uh, you do for us here in the county. So thank you so much. All right, if there's no other business before the board, we will stand adjourned.